pretty much outlines where the intersection is for safety alarms. And there are requirements in both of those standards, but as we'll see, there are other documents that have very important requirements um, that don't appear in those two main standards. And, and that's the main thrust of my uh, talk here today is that the, the, uh, the requirements appear across a number of different documents and they're very important requirements. It might not be clear that you really have to be looking at, in these places to, to capture the whole picture. So I'll start off with a definition that the real, that the, the main feature of a safety alarm is that it's an, it's an alarm that is used to uh, keep you safe. To, to, uh, if you're claiming risk reduction and it's an alarm, uh, if we call it a safety alarm. And there's a definition in 18.2 and in 9101 that you can, you can look at. Where are the requirements? As we'll see in 18.2 in a minute, there's a few shall statements in 18.2, but, but not a whole lot of them. There are a few more in the main standard 84, but again, I, in my opinion, there you can, there's definitely some aspects that can be missed. Uh, part two has some guidance, and the TR4 has very detailed guidance. Probably the, the, the biggest resource for requirements is uh, ISA 84 TR4, 9101, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, has it's a brief document, very significant uh, guidance in there. IEC 62682 is the IEC version of the 18.2 alarm management standard issued recently based on the 18.2. Uh, uh, not a whole lot of difference from the standpoint of safety alarms. There are more shall statements. There are more, you know, and some people get uptight about that, but but it's it's really not a whole lot of difference. Uh, 1167 is a pipeline sector alarm management recommended practice, very similar to ISA, ISA 18.2. They borrow uh, a whole lot of stuff from 18.2. Terminology is different. Some of the documentation is different. MU 191 was, uh, is, a, is an older document, very important foundational uh, source for 18.2, but not a standard, not a, not a work process. And the CCPS books, if we have time, we can talk. There's some very detailed guidance, very much in line with these other documents, but, but a more detailed discussion in those books. So we'll start off with what's in 18.2 as far as safety alarms. Well, right at the beginning of the standard, the purpose of the standard is to provide a methodology to improve plant safety, and it's in response to some of the high profile uh, accidents that have occurred as a result of alarms not being managed well. And the other the key with this standard is that successful performance, a successful alarm uh, system, is based on achieving human factors based metrics. Not a safety target the way uh, 84 would be. Some of the shall statements, you shall have an <coughs> MOC, use highest priority for, uh, for trip system failures, should use good engineering ju judgment uh, when doing alarm design, uh, may belong to the highly managed alarm class. Brief aside on that, alarm class is, is an attribute of an alarm different than priority. A class uh, specifies how an alarm is managed. So does it, are, are you allowed to, to bypass the thing or suppress the thing? Do you have uh, a process for, for management of change? Who has to sign off? And you might have groupings that where the answers to those questions are different, those would be classes. The only class that's actually defined in detail rather than being user-defined is highly managed, which was originally intended to fulfill PSM requirements. And if, and if, you, if you adopt and say, I'm using a highly managed, it triggers like 17 requirements, the extensive requirements uh, if you use that, but you don't have to use that. But it matches up very well with the stuff that's needed for safety alarms, in my opinion somewhat of a controversial question on the committee as to whether or not that, that class should be used. So in summary, there's a few requirements in 18.2, but there's not a whole lot. And there are a number of places where deference is given to ISA 84. It says for, for more detail on safety instrument and systems for safety uh, aspects of alarms, go to ISA 84. There are a number of statements in 18.2 to that effect. That's not to say there aren't significant requirements because safety alarms, being a subset of all alarms, have to follow this life cycle, which is a, a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of requirements. Okay, on to 84, high level, 
We want to identify the hazards, identify our SIFs, assign them to protection layers. Safety alarms generally are not SIFs because generally people don't take ten, uh, higher than 10 to 1 risk reduction, but we'll talk about that a little bit because sometimes folks do. And the life cycle is aimed at ensuring that those SIFs perform the way they, they do to maintain safety and integrity. Um, other standards, 61511 and 61508, really don't have a, uh, much in the way of dif differences from 84, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on those. I uh, will point out that in the uh, typical risk reduction methods in this so-called onion model, alarms are clearly identified as one of, the, one of the methods. Some of the shall statements, the requirements include, uh, I can let you read these here, alarm generated uh, in the, uh, by, the, by the SIS, uh, shall be in the, in the SRS, sorry. Uh, need to include human factors requirements for operability, maintainability, testability. There's really more to it on the human factor side than this, but this is something that's called out. Uh, and shall consider alarm part of the SIS if the operator response is needed to maintain safety. For example, if an alarm indicates an operator has to hit an ESD, it would fall under that, that category there. And uh, it needs to have a, appropriate proof testing and MOC if, if the, again, if that operator response is needed. Part two, I'm sure you're all aware, is a non-normative, it just doesn't have the shall statements, but it does have important clause by clause guidance on part one, and there are some that, that clauses that touch on uh, safety alarms, uh, most notably alarms with uh, risk reduction, advice on risk reduction claims. For, for less than 10 and greater than 10, uh, ISA 84 clearly states that any function that create claims more than a risk reduction of, of 10 needs to be managed per ISA 84. So this echoes that, that requirement, points out that the silk calcs need to include the operator, need to include the support system, because to display an alarm to an operator, you need power. The logic solver and the screen, et cetera, all need to work. So you need, you need to model your power and your, and your uh, so calculation. And if you, it points out you have to do a, a human factors analysis which includes common cause if you're going to use an operator for something with a risk reduction greater than 10. We move on to 849101. The, the main intent of this standard was to clarify that safety and uh, instrumentation extend beyond SIS, any kind of control alarm or inter interlock where you're claiming risk reduction falls under this standard and uh, needs to be in a mechanical integrity program. So it's not a long document, but the requirements are pretty important. <coughs> but you need to have a mechanical integrity program with things like testing and maintenance and uh, best engineering practice for, for design and installation and that sort of thing. Uh, TR404, which if you're not familiar, is a long document. It's, it's over 200 pages. Most of it is a series of annexes that are aimed at different uh, topics within the 84 umbrella, uh, and there's there's a couple, uh, a few uh, of those annexes that are pertinent to safety alarms. There's one, Annex B, is dedicated specifically to safety alerts and alarms, so there's a lot of good information uh, in this TR. Uh, it gives additional guidance on human factors. It, in fact, it gives specific guidance on, uh, there's a chart that gives specific guidance on risk reduction claims uh, and, and points out some of the other things that need to be worried about. Set point determination, very important. Need to consider operating range and measurement uncertainty, time available to respond, and the alarm set point and all those, those aspects need to be coordinated with the same thing with the corresponding SIF. So that's, a, that's an important part of it. Um, for alarms with less than a, a, a 10, here are the requirements that are, that are needed uh, to be considered. Um, and Human factors at the bottom, and probably most importantly, human factors need to be considered, but a quantitative analysis is not needed. However, if you go into the realm above 10, everything again needs to be managed per the IP84 standard. You need to make sure you have independence and you uh, consider common cause. Um, and there is there's a requirement for for a, a detailed uh, human factors analysis that's documented, which includes common cause. It has to, you have to validate that your operator response does what's intended in the time, in the time that's, that's allotted. So uh, 
very important requirements and a pretty high bar if, if you decide you want to go above 10. In fact, what we recommend to customers that do it is, is don't do this. Okay. We say don't do it. We say, as Bill said, run a wire. <laughs> Pull a wire to a device. <laughs> Uh, set point determination, as I said, you have to consider all these aspects and, the, and the, the key takeaway is you have to consider both the alarm and the SIP and coordinate the whole thing. So set point determination is, is an important thing. Uh, Annex Q has even more detail. There's some, some detail in Annex B, but Annex Q uh, written just for uh, set point determination. So good information in there. And in summary, takeaways. Requirements and best practices are don't only appear in the, in the two main standard documents, 18.2 and 84. Uh, there's, there's, they appear across multiple documents, and the requirements are largely consistent. You're not going to find a whole lot of disagreement. Maybe you know a, a few minor items here and there, but uh, they're they're consistent and they complement one another. And no one document really gives you the whole picture, in my opinion. I think especially the importance of human factors, if you just look at the I-18.2 and the 84, they, they will say things that boil down to human factors, but I, I think really the important requirements, uh, you need to go into those TRs to be able to, to, be able to get a, a feel for that. And the requirements are definitely significant. You have two life cycles to worry about, uh, and it, there's, a, there's a lot there, and just, again, human factors require special attention. Thank you.